Yo, have you heard of LinkedIn Learning? If you haven't, LinkedIn Learning is an American massive open online course provider. It provides video courses taught by industry experts in a variety of subjects. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because Living Corporate is in partnership with LinkedIn Learning to provide diversity, equity, and inclusion courses. Listen, if you're trying to be a better ally, you want to understand better diversity, equity, inclusion strategies, or you just want to learn how to be a better leader, you got to check out the courses on LinkedIn Learning. So check it out. You can do it one of two ways. You can click the link in the show notes or you go to LinkedIn Learning and you search Living Corporate again link in the show notes or go to LinkedIn Learning and search Living Corporate. I'll see you over there. It's Zach with Living Corporate, y'all. How you doing? What's going on? You know, I'm coming here thankful. Last week, I shouted out black women and I want to shout out black women again. You know what I'm saying? I Thank you, Shanisha, right? Thank you, Dr. White, for being a consistent contributor to Living Corporate, delivering incredible interviews, um, talking to all types of movers and shakers in and outside of the healthcare space. Um, I'm really excited about this interview. You're, you're going to hear her have uh, about the uh, reality of women at work. Evergreen topic, always fresh to talk about. And um, you're going to have a great discussion with her. OK, so make sure you hang tight. You stay tuned for that. Before you check in with Shanisha, I want you to tap in with Tristan, okay? We're going to listen to that. You're going to come back. You're going to hear Shanisha, and we're going to wrap it up. All right, see you soon. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, let's talk about what upskilling means and how you do it. Upskilling is another way of saying learning new skills, but with a twist. Upskilling is being driven by advances in technology and living more effectively in the digital world. It's no secret that new technologies, like artificial intelligence, are rapidly changing the way we work. While technology creates jobs, it has also led to the disappearance of them. To master the skills you need in this changing workplace, you must be deliberate in what you learn. Here are a few tips for employees on how to upskill. Be strategic. Identify what skills will be the most valuable in your job, workplace, or industry in the future. Technology is moving faster than the vast majority can be trained. Stay one step ahead. Honestly evaluate your strengths and weaknesses. A top performer has self-awareness. Know your weaknesses and work on them with humility. Ask for what you want. As an employee, you're in an advantageous position right now. The workforce is in flux and top talent is hard to attract and retain. Now is a perfect time to ask your employer for more responsibility or learning opportunities. But before you do, identify areas that will benefit your employer as well as help you progress along your career path. Upskilling is much easier with a plethora of courses available online, and many of those are free. Whether you want to take a professional certification course, a class for fun, or learn something altogether new, online learning is great. Coursera is a great online choice for professional development and course variety. Coursera's roots are in science, technology, and math. However, now you can find more than 2,700 courses in almost every field. It's an excellent choice for professional upskilling. LinkedIn Learning is for professionals who want day-to-day -day skill building. LinkedIn offers short classes to get you up to speed quickly. A lot of the classes are less than an hour and are designed as teasers but with a ton of information. Udemy suits the niche learner. Udemy instructors come from different backgrounds and experiences, and that is what makes it great. If your interest is making yourself more marketable in the future, take a peek at several job postings to see what companies want. Use that as a starting point for which online classes are worth taking to fulfill your long-term goals. This tip was adapted from an email sent by Ashley Stahl and brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. All right, what's up, everyone? This is Shanisha here at Living Corporate, and I'm so excited today to discuss and 
topic that I think we all can relate to. There's most times that we look for support within the workplace. And what could that support look like from leadership, white leadership? So today we'll be discussing practical actions for white leaders to support black women at work with an E, not an O. So let me introduce our guest. Like, this is a phenomenal woman, right? She has a lot of moving parts that are helping support Black women at work and women at work all together in totality, right? So our guest is the owner of a lifestyle management counseling and a board certified licensed clinical social worker in the states of Florida and Georgia, dual. (laughs) Her academic studies at Florida State University, shout out FSU. In addition to her years of postgraduate training, have propelled her experience to be unparalleled with mental health community. In addition to being named a subject matter expert for Action News for Jax, as well as having been selected as one of the top 20 under 40 professionals in the city of Jacksonville, Florida, she has also been recognized as one of the top 10 counselors. She's top tier. She is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc., and when not in the office, you can catch her amplifying the voices of women as the founder and creative behind Women at Work, with the E, not an O, (laughs) an empowerment, a women's empowerment networking and mentorship organization. So without further ado, I would like to present to you all today, Ms. Stephanie Jones. Stephanie, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, oh, I'm doing so great. You know, it's always awkward when you hear your bio, uh, or at least for me anyway. I'm always like, oh, girl, you doing the dang thing. You know, people deal with imposter syndrome all the time. Um, so when I hear my bio, I, you know, it feels accomplished. <laughs> Yes. You know, most times it's kind of hard to to accept that. It's kind of like those interview questions they're working on. They ask you, you know, tell me about yourself. You know, most times, especially we have humble beginnings, it's kind of always hard to kind of branch out and, you know, yeah. talk about yourself or hear all these great accomplishments. But yes, you are doing the thing. Yeah. yeah. I told so, in advance. I have a little Southern twang. So it's like, thank yes. God. Yeah. Hey, listen, they always pick at me so much for saying thank you kindly. I'm from Alabama, y'all. So it's, it's just a little Southern girl. Wait, what part? I am from a small town called Monroeville, Alabama. If you ever read the book To Kill a Mockingbird, that is me. How far is it from? Dothan. Dothan. I actually go through Dothan to get to Monroeville. So I travel through Dothan a lot. <laughs> okay, I'm so it's from Mariana, Florida. See, well, look at that. See there, y'all? It's the con- connections, y'all. It's the connections. It's definitely the vibe. Connection. She understands me. <laughs> so I gave an introduction that was amazing, right? Because she's done amazing things. But I want to make sure that I capture the fullness of who is Stephanie. So I would like for you, if you could color it in just a little bit more for us, add a little bit more spice to it of who is Stephanie Jones? Man, uh, so Stephanie Jones is a mother. Um, I have a 22-year-old who is in college. I have an 18-year-old that graduates next month and is going off to college. And I have a 14-year-old who is a kid baker and an entrepreneur herself. Um, So Stephanie is a mother. Stephanie is a lover of all things wellness. Um, I am all about making sure that not only are my clients taken care of, but even myself, you know, very much a lover of of wellness and all things mental health driven. Uh, I am a country girl. I'm from a small town. And when I say small town, 32 people in my graduating class, small town, you know, so I'm definitely used to country customs and country things. Uh, I am a lover of God, 100 um, percent. All things that I've accomplished to date have not been possible without his hand being in it. Uh, and I'm a woman at work. Yes, she is. Listen, first of all, you guys won't be able to see Stephanie outside of what you will see when we post her uh, and when you go and follow her page. Right. So Stephanie looks good, y'all. Y'all heard three he is. She looks amazing. <laughs> Nothing short of amazing. OK. <laughs> And she has done a lot of awesome things. So we're going to dive straight into it so you guys can learn more about Stephanie Women at Work in our discussion today. So tell us how the concept derived for Women at Work 
as well as Sidebar co-workspace. So congratulations for that. That just opened up, which is another branch or part of Women at Work. But how did you derive the concept of Women at Work? Man, um, so I am not from Jacksonville, Florida, which is where I'm located. Um, I moved to Jacksonville for love. Um, at the time, my now fiance uh, and I were dating at a distance. I lived in Atlanta uh, and he is from Jacksonville and lived here. And we played around with the idea of dating at a distance. And, you know, my only child complex came out and I was like, we're going to have to figure something out for me, you know. Uh, and so I moved to Jacksonville, um, did not know anybody except for him. And that was all sweet and good until it got old and I needed friends of my own. And, you know, finding friendships was challenging to say the least when you're not from the area. Um, a lot of my connections were built out of my relationship of which, you know, I wasn't trying to run from my relationship, but I need a little me time or I need a little girl time that was essentially separate from that. Um, and so I kind of went on a little hunt for friends and it started with just kind of like who was the easiest accessible, right? The relationships that I met, you know, through him, but even having to try to deepen those connections beyond a cookout or a barbecue. Um, and so I really started concentrating on what experiences I felt like I was missing because I felt a little homesick even in not being in Atlanta. And so what experiences could I relive in Jacksonville that I experienced when I was in Atlanta? Um, and so I noticed when I moved to Jacksonville that like the dress code was just a lot more casual than I was used to. You know, I could go to, you know, Target in Atlanta and everybody's dressed to the nines. And I'm like, man. And then you go to Target in Jacksonville and you're like, hmm, I'm slides. You know, hmm. And, you know, I just kind of like it just was a thing for me, um, you know, and I was like, OK, it doesn't mean that Jacksonville is bad. It's just rather than complain about what you're not receiving, then sometimes you got to create space for that. And so I started hosting dinner parties. I would say, OK, every quarter we're going to meet at this restaurant that nobody knows or nobody's ever tried, because that's how I learned my way around Jacksonville as well was through food. And so that we would meet every quarter and we would have what we would call fly events, which was first love yourself. And so at these fly events, everybody was it's required to get fly, get dressed up, put some clothes on, put a little makeup on your face or put a little mm -hmm. oil on your face, something to keep it hydrated. Yeah. Stay you know, and like, let's be cute. Let's have some good conversation. Let's meet new people. You know, let's explore new foods like let's connect. Right. Because that's the easiest way. Definitely for us as black folks is to connect over food. Um, and so I would do that event quarterly and it just grew into, you know, this conference that I started hosting because I realized that there were so many women, not only that I was meeting just kind of socially and personally, but even in business as a therapist, you know, being in Jacksonville, it's a very big transient kind of place. And so there's three military bases over here and, you know, like people move around a lot. So it's harder to connect with relationships, even in that sense, because you're not there for long. And so I kind of took all of those kind of pain points and said, well, let me just try to have like one day that everybody can come together and network and just kind of connect with each other. I wasn't 100 percent sure of essentially what I wanted it to be. I just knew that I wanted to be able to bring people together, have a good time, learn some information since you go home and apply that in your own life. Yes. Little did I know that that event was going to turn into an annual event that I would host, that I would transition my focus from just personal relationships to empowering women in small business, particularly women of color. Um, and that now has grown from a dinner party to an annual conference to now a co-work space that has now become a shared workspace for women and essentially a welcome center if you're not from Jacksonville. Um, for you to become more familiar with you know, the women that are movers and shakers here in the city, for you to become more aware of what black owned woman owned businesses are here locally. And so a lot of it was just, you know, me focusing on not complaining about pain points that I experienced, but being a part of a solution that I felt like was viable. And of course, with any solution, you kind of keep building, you know, on that. So I never would have imagined years then that this is where I would be now, but I'm so happy to be here. Listen, that is simply amazing because you go from 
good to great. And over the course of time, building relationships can be a little bit difficult, especially being new to a city, being new to work. It's always like, okay, freshman on campus, how how do I do this? How how do I, you know, connect over whatever? What similarities do we have? How how can we do this? And y'all love to eat, so I'm definitely connecting over some food. <laughs> We're food definitely connecting tough. over some food. Tough. Like women are tough. Like we women are, are tough, tough and we're tough to each other. And mm-hmm. baby will size you up in a minute and you'll be like, your shoes sure are together, the your hair are together. The yes. And that's a very intimidating environment to be a part of, especially depending on as you move up the ladder, you know, mm-hmm. you just feel just this sense of a lack of welcome. You yes. know, in those mm-hmm. spaces. And so I wanted to create an organization that was very reflective of my personality, which mm-hmm. is very warm, which is very inviting. If I see you're a wallflower on the wall, I'm like, girl, what you doing over here? Like, what's what's up? You know, so I do feel like the events that I that I host or anything that I'm a part of is designed to take the life of the person who's hosting it. Mm-hmm. So if you got a dry personality, then that's why your event is dry. You know, unless you can surround yourself with people that don't have that, you know, yeah. it's it's reflective of the people that are in charge. And sometimes you you really have to step out of yourself. I know most times we as women have our, our small or close circle of friends, but you have to get to a space where you can open up a little bit more and make new friends. And I know what is that, Drake? No new friends or whoever. I forgot who's on the song, y'all. But, you know, you have to get to a space where you can make new friends because when you're looking to expand, not only for your personal growth, but for your brand, for your family, whoever, whatever that you decide to do, you will need to make those connections and those bonds. And they can come quite naturally by going to spaces such as the co-work space and, and meeting women there who share similarities or like mind traits or however that you guys can work on or they can help improve you because I'll be honest with you if you're in a space where you're no longer feeling challenged within your friendships that may be a space that you kind of need to grow <laughs> grow out of look for others that may challenge you we can get comfortable in these things but right now is the time where you definitely need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and growth can cause uh, a little bit of uncomfortability so this is a great time for you to connect with the co-work space and women at work so uh how How did you make the transition from your previous employment experience to create an experience such as women at work? Oh, girl, I straddled the fence for so long. Oh, (laughs) my goodness. Don't we all? Oh, man, I straddled the fence for so long, you know, and I said it a little bit earlier, you know, that I'm a calculated risk taker. Um, And being a mother and having little people that or big people in this case little big people that are, you know, dependent upon me to provide or our family, I should say, to provide. Um, It's very tough for me to make a decision without making sure that it's a good decision, you know, to make. And so because Women at Work was always a passion project for me, right? It wasn't that I just straight went into that. It was Women at Work was something fun for me. And I like to get dressed up. And are there other people that like to get dressed up? Cool. Um, Can we empower each other at the same time? Yes. You know, and so for me, it was a very much of a calculated risk where I straddled the fence. You know, I have worked as a counselor for over 10 years and have worked primarily with the military. And and so because of that, you know, I was like, OK, this job is cushy, right? It's cushy. It's easy. I know what to do. I know what to expect. Sometimes it's better to have the devil, you know, than the devil you don't. You know, and so I was very familiar with what my role was. And so it was hard to step away because I just enjoyed the consistency of my paycheck. And I enjoyed not really having to work too hard. Um, And that because I was only hosting this event once a year, I was only really stressed out for about six months out of the year. But as Women at Work started to expand, you know, because I went into that situation only wanting to do that conference. And then as I connected with more women, as I learned more about their needs, as I learned more about the gaps that just were such a challenge, especially for women of color, Mm -hmm. um, even through my own process, whether it was booking a venue, whether it was working with certain companies, um, just those different encounters that I had, I felt like a personal responsibility to do more. 
even when I didn't have to do more because I do enough in my day to day job as a therapist. Right. I'm serving the the, I'm saving people's lives every day, you know, because it's been tough during this time of COVID, you know. So to take that and to say, yes, I'm going to add a little bit more. It has to be of God because I definitely wouldn't ask for him to give me anything that he didn't think that I could handle. And so, you know, even during times where it was just me, that risk was even still something that I had to calculate along the way. So I would work my full time job during the day and do that full because I was on an alternative work schedule, which essentially Mm -hmm. means that I would work four days out of the week and I would be off every other Friday. Um, So I work 10 hour days. And so I would go from working that 10 hour day and then I would also do my women at work stuff in the evening. And the thing about any small business, whether you are straddling the fence, whether you are transitioning into it, I mean, you have to really, you know, really be willing to sacrifice time. Mm-hmm. Now, for me at my age now, my biggest commodity is energy. How much energy do I have to be able to give? What is my capacity like? Then it was time. How much time do I have to really invest in this thing that I want to do? Um, and because my kids are older, you know, and even consulting with them, it was a lot easier for me to make that transition because they were a part of it. And it wasn't just mom is working on this and, you know, no, I'm not going to make that recital. No, I'm not going to be there because I got to focus on this. It was, okay. do you notice that my schedule is just a little too jam packed? Do I need to give a little bit more time in this area? So they were always kind of constantly involved in that process. So it made it a lot lighter to be able Mm -hmm. to take it on. But even still, it was a calculated risk of, okay, I don't have a business plan. Let me stress that for sure. That's something, you know, hindsight is 2020. I was yes. resistant towards mm-hmm. creating that business plan because I just didn't want to sit down and try to think about all of those things. And this is still just a framework, right? Who knows what's yes. going to happen? And it just, I just couldn't, I couldn't attach myself to finding that to be valuable for me, even though I knew it was valuable. I was just like, no, I can spitball my way through this. And I did. However, mm-hmm. I'm glad that it worked out. But I would never encourage anyone else to do the same because now that I reflect on it, I definitely should have went that route of just like working out the plan, figuring out essentially what lane I was going to travel down, executing that, and then essentially modifying it as I go. Me, I'm a blind faith kind of person, blind confidence. Jump off the porch with that. Okay, I will sink or I will swim. Even if I sink, I'm still going to try to find a way to be able to pull myself up because I know I'm resilient. But in my case, I swam and I swam very, very long and I've gone very, very far with it. So thank you, Lord, for that grace. I appreciate it. (laughs) You know, so I would encourage anyone that's listening is everybody's process is going to be different. Yes. Yes, Some people do go to business plan route. Some people don't. Some people never create one. But it just kind of depends on as you start traveling in different rooms with different people, whether that's at the corporate level, small business to small business corporations and working together that you start expanding your needs based on that. So I finally got to the place year five where I actually needed to have a business plan. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, I had grown so much financially that I could just pay somebody to do it. But everybody doesn't have that that type of ability. So sometimes you do have to bloom where you're planted. Uh, That is... uh, That response, y'all, I'm not sure if y'all are really catching on. That was packed with a lot of gems and a very in-depth response. So I'm not sure if y'all gonna have to go back here, rewind just a few 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds to capture all that. But she gave you a lot. Having a business plan is extremely important when you are looking to make that transition. Uh, If you don't know how, we're in the know-how phase right now of life where you can Google. (laughs) You can Google these things. You can listen to podcasts. um, You can YouTube these things on how to create these business plans so you can map out what that looks like. And I'm not sure if you're also capturing, she had the support of those who are around her. Having that support system is essential in holding you accountable to your plan. Okay, and working through that process with you. So there's just a lot to unpack there and making the transition can be tough and you can be struggling with friends where you're just not sure if, hey, do I want to keep this nine to five or do I want to just go ahead and like she said, jump off the porch and go straight into becoming an entrepreneur and managing this business and managing people. It's a lot to think about. 
especially when you're going from being comfortable from receiving this paycheck in health insurance and all these benefits to now I'm solely out here by myself. What do I do next? And when you are in alignment, those things happen to work out for your good. Okay. Like it all works out for your good. It comes into a space now where she's at year five and she can pay somebody. <laughs> to make this business plan for her and have a very fluent business that has been inspirational to so many women. I mean, amongst the thousands. So now that you've made this transition, you've created women at work. Who are the women at work? Who are women at work? Man, well, women at work is is taking on a new face now, right? Um, So in the beginning, women at work was, listen, everybody. Right. No matter what you look like, what your thing is, whether you got a small business, don't have a small business, come, come just as you are. Um, I think that's the church girl in me. Right. Just come just mm-hmm. as you are. Um, and I, of course, I learn in that process of developing my business how much more specificity that I needed. And I know that that's hard because in a time where we're pushing and campaigning for diversity, you know, in business, you got to have a lane. You know, and that once you find your lane, then you make that amazing. And then you can do all of the other things that you want to do. Right. It's always about going from point A to point B and not A to Z, because you have to be able to build on an original idea that you have. And even that idea is rooted out of a problem. Like you've got to have a problem no matter what. If there's nothing that you're solving, then you're just doing it as a hobby. You know, so you're really looking, especially when you're looking to pitch for funding or financing or sponsorship, things of that nature. They want to be able to see tangible numbers about what impact that you've created. You know, so I really had to focus on the type of women that I was looking to attract to be a part of our now space, which is it's primarily focused on women entrepreneurs. It is primarily focused on women of color that are entrepreneurs, still open and still flexible to other demographics, but I want to be able to focus on people that need it the most. And I was one of those women that, you know, in the absence of knowing how to do something, thank God I had people that were supporters and willing to share information about their journey or to share where they made a mistake or to share who they use for this or who they use for that. You know, I was definitely lucky in that sense, but I also encountered people that weren't helpful that they wouldn't take my call or that they didn't respond to my email or that they looked at my page and I didn't have a large enough following and all of those things that we all go through when we first get started. But I was very, very disciplined and very, very dedicated and relentless towards this is something that I feel is important. And you have to be willing to be your own cheerleader. Like you have to be the flavor flav of your own life. Like you got to have somebody that's the hype man That's like, no, like you can do this. You can figure it out because in the middle of the night when you're up thinking about something you should be doing or working on your computer or, you know, rocking the baby to sleep, whatever it may be, you got to keep cheerleading yourself. And so like the women at work that are a part of the network, like they're go getters. You know, I'm not a lazy chick. Right. But so a lot of it takes on the personality of me. Right. Narcissistically in that way, you know, is like I'm not a lazy person. I'm a very disciplined person. I'm a very welcoming person. I'm a person that likes to avoid negative energy. I don't like competition. I'm a collaborator, right? So I have to start thinking personally about what things do I value. It has nothing to do with the person that I'm working with. What's your core like? What's your character like? So the women that are part of Women at Work, they're built and cut from that same type of cloth where I don't have to follow behind you to find out if you got that done. Because your personality is one that likes to make sure your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. I don't even have to second guess it. But from an administrative capacity, we'll check on it anyway. You know, so it's just important to really essentially think a little bit more selfishly about, you know, the type of people that you want to be surrounding you. And whether it's from women at work and those women that will become now members of women at work. Right now we have an internal network to exchange referrals. Right. If you're coming to Jacksonville and you're trying to start a small business, you better make sure that you are part of women at work, because not only are we pulling in those women that are small business owners. Now we're in that position where we're pulling in those corporate entities and those professionals of those women that aren't looking to do that. But they have the access to larger pots of money or larger companies that can support us in different ways. So I like sitting in the middle because now I have a hand in both sides and I can help both entities. Wow. What a way to pave the way 
for women, women of color, the diversity, and then having your own lane, creating such a space for women to be able to come together and collaborate in a way where it supports their dream or their efforts to be better at whatever that craft is and just be better as women all together. So this is in a magnificent way of women being able to come together. Just like you said, it could be hard meeting new people and it could be hard making that transition, but if you've created a space where women can come and do that safely <laughs> and let your guard down and be as creative as you can be and having that accountability partner and being able to open up and to pull in so many different things that you can take and tailor it for you and your business. So it's it's awesome yeah. support that's being provided in this space and shout out to you for doing that. See small girl, small yeah. country girl doing big things, <laughs> big, big things. Wow. And I just appreciate that. You're so humble and all that you do. So we're talking about that support. What practical actions can white leadership white leadership provide to support black and brown women at work? Because we've there there may be transitions that you may want to make at work, right? And you're not exactly sure on how to do it. And we may find at times within our workspaces that there may not be leadership like us, that look like us and represent us, that can have the authority to make things happen for us. And some of us may feel shortchanged in that way and may not feel comfortable approaching leadership and saying what that support looks like for us. But from your perspective, what practical actions can white leaders take to help provide that support for a woman of color? And mm -hmm. what has been your experience? Ooh, yeah. So... So I'm from a small town, and even though I'm from a small town and it is predominantly white, I never felt different, I guess. That's probably the best way to describe it. None of my none of my white counterparts ever made me feel different. Nothing that I can reflect on where I felt uncomfortable. Um, I didn't really experience like any sort of microaggressions or discomfort, probably until I was working. Because I didn't even experience at Florida State, which is where I went to college and predominantly white institution. Um, it wasn't until I started working that I started to experience that the most. Um, it wasn't as much from white men as it was from white women. Um, and so, you know, going into a field where it's a human services profession um, of mental health and all of those things, you kind of have a natural preconceived notion that everybody's here to help, <laughs> which is true in some instances, but some people are there to help some people and some people are not there to help some people. And I remember when I first started working um, for the military and my first day, my supervisor was a white woman and I remember her just not really being welcoming and I couldn't put my finger on it. Like it was just kind of like, all right, yeah, you're here today. Here's your office. You know, and it was just almost the way that she would talk to me that felt very belittling and felt very demeaning. And even though I knew that I was new into the position, I still know my job, you know, and it just didn't feel it didn't feel warm. And I set the tone for that environment very, very quickly because it was something that I felt I didn't agree with it. And I knew that if I didn't say anything, especially being that I was new, then it was just going to continue for the long haul. And I know that that's not easy to do, because when we go into a new job, we always feel like we're representing the culture all the time, and especially if we're in a predominantly white space. And so I felt that energy, but I almost ignored it. Like, well, then you're going to get to know this one today, you know. And so I went to she, we were walking down the hallway and I remember her making some sort of comment that I didn't like to tell you how not serious it was. I don't even remember what the hell it was. Um, and so she made some sort of comment that I didn't like. And I turned around to her and I told her that her behavior her conduct and the way that she was speaking to me was unprofessional. And that if she wanted to speak with me about anything, then there's a way for us to go about doing that. Whether she wanted to speak with me privately in her office or mine, but it was not going to take place in this hallway that was available for public consumption. Now, in that moment, all I saw was her mouth just stay open and just be dropped at the fact that not only is this new person saying something to me, this chick saying something to me, this black lady saying something to me, and, you know, she essentially just kind of like gave me an eye roll and moved on. We had that type of relationship for a while. Now, the thing about it was that it wasn't Stephanie specific. It was amongst the whole culture up in there. But I was like, OK, so it's you, boo. It's not me. 
Um, and, but I felt like I needed to speak up, you know, and I'm going to get to my point for sure. And so what I've come to learn about black people in predominantly white spaces is that we have gone through so much trauma in our generations and experiences that we have become accustomed to silence. And silence was something that was forced upon us before, right? Don't say nothing, you know, don't want to make massa upset, you know, don't want to be shipped off somewhere where you can't find your kids or your husband or any of those things, you know, and then you transition towards, we'll say my parents' generation and even my grandparents' generation, where you tell a person, be seen and not heard, right? Stay in a child's place, right? All of those types of things that silence people from speaking up a bit against injustice or things that are hurtful or things that don't make sense to them because sometimes parents can't explain it. Sometimes they can't make it make sense. So in an effort to deal with it, then they just shut you down, right? Control. All of those are power and control relationships. And usually the person that cares the least is the person who has the most power and control. We tend to not feel like we have power. And so as a result, we continue to reinforce being silent. So what can, you know, our, our white counterparts do to be more supportive in those spaces? Take initiative. Take initiative to get to know someone as a person, regardless of what their gender is, regardless of what their color is, their racial background, their spiritual journey, like attempt to get to know someone and take initiative to do that. Just because somebody looks different from you doesn't mean that there's nothing that you can relate on. And I say that as a person who is a therapist that sits on the other side of people that don't look like her all of the time. And that it's important for me to create a space that makes people feel comfortable to open up about their deep, dark, dirty secrets. Right. And so if I can take the initiative to let my guard down to create a welcoming space, it, that means it's possible for anybody. So if that's not happening, it's because you're in some sort of resistance to that where you feel a spirit of entitlement. I shouldn't have to do that, whether you got a spirit of laziness and don't feel like doing that, whether it's a spirit of perfectionism. I won't do that unless I can do it right. You know, it's all of these things that are just limiting beliefs that prevent you from just getting to know somebody at their core and what their character is like. So my advice, you know, to to our white friends and our white allies and even those that aren't is take some time to get to know somebody. Take initiative to get to know someone. Because you may really, really miss out on an amazing opportunity just because of bias. That is powerful. If you don't get to know someone, how can you really, <laughs> how can you really work in that space with them? How can you, you really? Know if you can relate or not because you don't know. You don't know anything, and I think just like you said, for the most part, with our culture, when we go to work, we feel as though we're representing the culture, the entire culture, and it's a lot, right? Not only just yourself. And when you're in that space, you're quiet. You don't know what to say, how to say it. If you say it, is it, you know, going to be taken back to leadership? Am I going to be disciplined for that? So you you tend to be quiet. And when you see things happening, not only to other, yourself, but other counterparts, it just continues the process. It's almost as if some may say silence is consent. You have to get to a space where you're able to Stand up for yourself, of course, respectfully, but stand up for yourself in a way that shows up not only for you, but for everyone else. By being silent, you're not showing up to work as your best self, right? You're just showing up and you're just doing the job. And you'll essentially get to a space where you will resent leadership. You resent the space that you're in. You grow to become uncomfortable. The job grows to become weary. And it's creating a toxic environment where you will end up on the other side of Stephanie, where you're sharing how you feel about work and the stress that is weighing on you, the weight gain, the hair loss, um, you know, the, the skin. Your skin is not glowing as it should. It becomes to really weigh on you and it impacts you when you get home, you know. So it's a continuous thing where leadership, in white leadership, because then we look at a lot of these, uh, you know, higher paying organizations, most of the leadership is white. There's not many of us women of color or uh, people of color in leadership. And sometimes there is. And for those that are in that space, sometimes they're not as welcoming. So I would definitely say to take a moment to get to know get to know your counterparts and, and really take a dive into who they are as a person. So that way, you know, that can create a more healthy environment for us to work in. And, and Stephanie, let me ask you this. How can women 
of color advocate for ourselves when we have that lack of support so we're telling white leadership hey i need for you to get to know me take initiative to know me but what can we do for ourselves to help advocate for that support well you have to think about what person you want them to get to know because we tend to code switch very yes, easily yes, depending on what, what environment that we're in um and in your process of being more authentic you know with yourself and who you are thinking about what things that you feel comfortable sharing. You don't have to share everything about what's happening in your life for them to know, you know, that you're having a barbecue or your in-laws are coming this weekend, right? It doesn't have to be that deep, but do you take the time to allow them something to get to know, you know? So think about the person that you want them to have a relationship with, you know? So even in those spaces, especially when I was talking about my former position, you know, I wanted them to get to know Stephanie, Right. Who Stephanie is as a person that works with you every day. So all of those same characteristics that I outline as it relates to women at work, you know, those are the, the characteristics, you know, characteristics that I represented when I was on the job as well, coupled with doing a good job, coupled with being tight at my job. And so because I knew those things about myself, as well as my ability to do a good job, then that helped me to stand in being authentically myself and being proud about that, right? Imposter syndrome is rooted out of your feelings of lack, right? The things that you feel like you're not good enough or that you feel like in comparison to someone else, whether it's somebody else you work with, somebody you see on social media, whatever it may be, you get into that spirit of competition and you're comparing yourself. So now you feel lack, you feel like you're not good enough. And so I didn't feel that way, right? I may have experienced those feelings before, but they don't last for very long. Because when you read something like someone's bio, you start looking at the things that you have overcome. And that's how I look at the things that I have accomplished up to this point is that it's not about success, right? Success is something, yeah, yeah. We're, it's a term we use often, but for me, it's about accomplishment. So I, I, I frame it differently for myself so that I feel a lot more comfortable with walking in that and stepping into it because we tend to water down the things that we have accomplished or overcome is because we feel like we got to be humble or modest. You can still be humble and exercise humility and modesty while celebrating something you have overcome. So adjusting your framework in the way that you even look at that is to say, okay, I am accomplished. I have overcome something, right? I overcame all them classes I had to take. I had to overcome all of those tests that I had to take to get that license and to do all of those things. And I should celebrate those. So if, you know, for women, allow yourself to be seen. Like if you're good at your job, be good at your job because they will always, they will, they will award you with more work when you do a good job. And at that point, you get to a place where you almost kind of transcend beyond being forced to do all of that kind of medial grunt work because you have now put yourself in a different position or a different type of eyes now sees the work that you do. So now maybe it's not your boss, maybe it's your boss's boss that sees what you do. And now you've been elevated into her position because you just allowed yourself to shine. So if anything, you know, for women, you got to let your light shine a little bit more and that your humility is rooted in your ability to celebrate what you have overcome and not that you just have to succeed. This is true because your gifts will make room for you, right? You show up as your, as your best self and allow yourself to be open in a space where you can really thrive and work at your at your highest level. Because, okay, we know that they're looking at performance, right? And just like you said, you never know who is mentioning your name in that room based off of what you are doing by showing up as your best self and allowing your personality to show through and shine through. You don't have to be intimidated <laughs> by those who you're working with. Just like they're taking the initiative to get to know you, you get to know them. That's why emotional intelligence is so important, right? So you're getting to know these people and they're getting to know you and you're allowing yourself to show up as your best self and do your work and perform at such the highest level. You never know what spaces are being created for you uh, to be in, to advocate for us, right? We're coming up behind you. There's so many other women who are coming up behind you who would like those opportunities as well. And Stephanie, I say this, uh, you know, we just spoke about earlier how sometimes getting to know other women can be a little intimidating. And it almost reminds me of an episode, for some of y'all, this may be too old, but an episode of Girlfriends where Joan and Tony have completely fallen out 
And <laughs> she now has Lynn and Maya, and they're working out in Joan's living room with one of the young ladies that used to play on Nickelodeon, Taina, right? And Taina's like, you're complaining about these friends. You you say you don't have the support of your friends. Why don't you just get new friends? And Joan is like, listen, when you get over 30, you don't have time for new friends. Like, we're not doing that. But in this space, we're seeing that we are. So how can women support women at work? Because there may be times where you may be intimidated to approach another woman in leadership or another colleague. So how can women support women at work? Shoot your shot all the time. You got to shoot your shot no matter what. Um, You know, there is no one person that I'm afraid to reach out to. And regardless if they respond back to that email, that DM, that text message, whatever it may be, Um, I've become very comfortable with failure and things not working out is because there's going to be so many more things in my life that don't work out than those things that do, because everything that everyone can see in a bio or everything that people can see on your website or, you know, when you are at a speaking engagement is that that's just a highlight reel. Right. I think recently I posted maybe a couple of weeks ago, I had posted Um, My Excel document, right, because I'm a person who is a serial like tracker and organizer of stuff. So like I was applying to grants, so many grants. And so I needed a way to keep them organized and central in one place. And so I'm just applying, 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 regardless if it works out. I'm just going to apply. If I see it, cool, I'm going to apply because in my mind, I'm increasing the likelihood and probability of one of them working out. If I just keep applying and not getting so fixated, oh, God, I got to get this 10 grand. Oh, God, I got to get this five grand. You know, I was able to remove the pressure of waiting for the outcome. And so I just kept applying. So then I posted like a video of all of the grants that I had applied to. And all you see is denied, 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 denied. And then it's like funded, denied, 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 funded, you know. And I know that, you know, I wanted to post that on purpose is because people don't see the BTS of, of what's happening, you know, and. People only want to support what they feel like is popular or what they feel like is popping or what's going. But there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. You know, so I always encourage women to shoot your shot. Send that message. Send that DM. You know, they can if they respond back. That tells you a lot about yourself, you know, is like, yes, the way that you crafted that email, the time of day when you sent it, maybe even the person to answer the email, everything about the universe aligned in that moment for that person to respond back to you no matter if it was with a yes or a no. And that was something that was very encouraging for me. If I could just get you to respond back, oh man, we cooking with grease. You know, oh God, don't let me get you on the phone because then the sales comes in and I'm really throwing everything about my personality at you. You know, so you just have to learn a lot more about yourself and kind of what your superpower is in business or even in your profession and double down on that thing, you know? So it's just, don't be afraid to shoot your shot because the worst you know, situations you can be in is the ones that you don't take, right? You got to shoot the shot. Yes, absolutely. This reminds me of a little quote I used to always say as a child. It's not like you never heard no before. It's not your first time hearing no, right? Yes. <laughs> but I know for people, I know that it means something, right? I think that that's the thing about it is that mm-hmm. that no means something. You know, it we is. feel like a lot of our value and our worth is tied oh, up yes. in, in that, right? When things work mm-hmm. out or things don't work out. If I had to like quantify my worth based on the things that haven't worked out in my life, I'd be depressed like Mm -hmm. I genuinely would. And I know that the reason why we feel that way is because we've become depressed by the outcome. So I tried not to invest so much of my energy in the outcome. If it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, there was a lesson for me to learn. Maybe Mm -hmm. I didn't apply as well as I thought I did. Maybe my head is a little too big and I'm like, oh, maybe you don't deserve that, you know. In that time, but we never want to think of ourselves in that way. We always want to try to think of ourselves as deserving of everything, you know, that God has for us, but not realizing that sometimes the things that don't work out are for your protection. Yes. And listen, there's there's two quotes that I have here. So like I was saying with the no, it's not your first time hearing no, right? But you could be one no closer to your yes. And as for your Excel sheet, when you're seeing the deny, 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 the funded and all the deny, deny, denies, I would like to also say to you and to our listeners, delay doesn't mean denial, right? So it all works according to the timing that it's supposed to and plays out for you as it should. And just like you said, shooting your shot, shooting your shot 
and sending that DM can open up an opportunity for something great to be on the other side of that. Or it may not have been that right person for you, or it just may not have been that right time for you all to connect, but you never know what else will come into place for all these things to come into alignment for you to bring about whatever that desire is that you have deep down, right? So women supporting women at work, I think is extremely essential when we have these spaces that we would like to be in and just the trajectory of what you would like to do. So being able to reach out, send that DM, connect with other resource groups that you have within the organization, or just connect with the women on your team. You know, you kind of want to start it at home in that space where you guys are able to transition out. So the support is extremely essential. And just like you said, Stephanie, sometimes we tie that to our self-worth and who we are and okay what is it about me that's not connecting with those people and sometimes there may be a space for that you know that development that you can work on and other times it just may not be and that's okay that's okay you have to be able to take some of the wins with the losses and continue to move forward um, and continue to be the best version of yourself so there has been so much packed into this episode. Like it's a lot. And I loved every bit of it. Stephanie is absolutely amazing, y'all. Absolutely amazing. So I want to make sure that we capture just a few more things, such as any key takeaways that you would like for our listeners once they close out this podcast. What would you like them to walk away with? Hmm. Actually, I'm going to share one thing that someone shared with me recently. Um, Angelica Pompey. She is the owner of Pompey Portraits, a serial woman at work. Um, most certainly the yes queen for everybody. Um, and so she was one of our speakers for our most recent conference. And she shared something that I was like, that is a good idea. And she's very big on being unique. Right. And I would encourage your listeners to look for opportunities to be unique or to show something unique about yourself. And so what she said was, you know, in a DM, she sends a video direct message. She doesn't just send it like via text. And I'm like, oh man. And, you know, she sends a video direct message as a way to try to even deepen the connection of that personalized experience. Or if she meets someone out at a networking event and they exchange social media, then she'll send them a video message as well, you know, so she's very good about personalizing, you know, her connection because it's memorable, right? People don't do that as often, you know, to send you a video message, right? At first, I'm like, who is this creep in my DM sending me a video <laughs> message, you know, but be okay with that too. Don't think so yeah. much about what the person on the other end is thinking. You know, if I go to a networking event for someone else, you know, I'm not going to receive. I'm actually going to give. Because if I'm going to receive, all I'm thinking about is like, who am I going to meet? What am I going to say? You know, what information am I going to share? Are they going to think I'm crazy? Are they think I'm doing the most? Whatever it may be, you get mm -hmm. just wrapped up in all of those thoughts. And so I go to give. I go to being in service, right? Let me go and just kind of like hang out. I'm going to give some time and meet some new people. You know, I let it be organic. Um, one of my favorite books is How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it talks a lot about you know, treating, not focusing on the group of people in one room, but one person and try to personalize connecting with that one person. And even during that conversation, make it about them. The more that you can make a conversation about somebody else and just let them bloop, 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 and just keep going. People like talking about themselves. Right? Listen, I show people that all the time because they get so nervous when meeting new people and connecting with new people and networking. If you, there's something called 70, 30. If you ask the right question, 70% of the time, excuse me, 30% of the time, you can allow that person to talk 70%. That takes the stress and the pressure and the anxiety off of you. People love to do nothing more than talk about themselves. Yes. That's why my business is so lucrative. Yes, people love to talk about themselves. So let them do it. <laughs> That's why people like coming to talk to me because they get to vent and mm -hmm. they get to share without interruption or somebody interjecting or cutting them off or making them feel like their feelings are invalid, all of that stuff, you know. So try to try to not go into these situations with the intent of receiving, right? You go to give something while you're there, right? Even if it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting where you're You've reached out to someone and they responded back and they're like, let's do coffee or happy hour. Take a peace offering. 
Take a little something as like a small little gift just to break the ice, whether it's, oh man, I found this new book that I'm reading. I love it. Whether it's, oh my gosh, I read a little information in your bio that you love this and I figured I'd do that. People don't personalize stuff like they used to. Those are the things that I remember when I have interns to come in and they do their interview process, even to be you know, a clinician. I'm most impressed by those young ladies that not only send me a follow up as soon as we get off the call. I'm like, baby, did you have that ready as soon as we got off the call? You know, those that follow up because I am so busy and it's never, you know, intentional. It's just that I'm trying to keep all of those things, you know, together. Um, so people that follow up and then people that do something, something that's just memorable in some way. Right. Somebody sent me a personal thank you card. I would have thought she put that in the mail two days before the actual meeting because I got it on the same day. And it was just a little handwritten thank you note. You know, so just look for ways to kind of like emancipate yourself from this social media like tornado. You're, it's not about you trying to be anybody other than yourself. And the more that you spend more of that time trying to compare and trying to do what somebody else is doing, no, right? I have a market for people that support women at work and somebody else has a market for something else. That don't mean we can't work together. It just means that we serve a different market and that's cool. So a lot more people have to get a lot more comfortable with just being themselves and if people don't like it, then that's where you need to come to therapy and see me so we can work on that. Y'all heard him. <laughs> <laughs> come, take, come take a visit. And you know. Yeah, I'm going to get you in one place. I'm going to get you in one or the other. You guys have to connect with her and, and get that support. So, Stephanie, you share it so, so much. And I'm so appreciative for your time here with us today and just enlightening women on, I mean, everything that we discussed today. And in totality, I'm just seeing the overarching things that, that support and being your whole self. So are there any shout outs that you would like to give? You know, I would like to give a shout out to my fiance. Um, he has to. He has to bear the brunt of all of this that y'all get all of the time. <laughs> you no, know, he has to bear the brunt of my schedule and my timelines when I'm a nice person, when I'm not a nice person. So I have to give a shout out to him for being so patient and having so much grace with your girl as she is on this amazing incline of everything that is happening, has happened and will happen with women at work. Um, I have to give a shout out to my team because at one point it was a party of one um, and now it's a party of nine. Um, and so I have to give all the love in my heart to my team um, that they are they are relentless to trying to help me get there. And I love it because they're all small business owners themselves. And so the mission, you know, even in serving as a team member is for us to be able to support each other. Like, what are you lacking? What do you need help with? Can women at work help you with that? Okay, we have a graphic designer. Can you help somebody else with their logo or their website because they just got started? You know, so it's always about internally referring, but you only want to be surrounded by people that are part of your dream team. I know it's going to be plenty of people that want to help you along the way, but just like everybody, you don't want them praying for you. You don't want everybody working for you either. You know, so it's important for you to be very particular <laughs> And almost selfish about the people that you surround yourself with, because those people have the ability to power you forward or derail you entirely. You know, so I have to give all the love, you know, to my team for everything it is that they do to keep me sane, organized. They have to reel me in a lot because I am so full of ideas all of the time. So um, the last shout out I'd like to give is to you. Um, you me? for yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, you for creating a space, one for yourself, um, and venturing out to do something of this magnitude to provide information and resource, a platform for other people to be able to share what it is that they're doing. Right, you're in the business of service versus a product. Right, you got to spend your time doing this, right? So an hour that you spend is an hour that you did make money in some way, or maybe you did make money in some way. So I have to give shout out to you for stepping out and, and doing what it is that you do and creating a space for anybody to share their message. And I encourage you that no matter at what point in this journey that you're on, I'm 100% in your corner. If there's something that I can do to support you or provide more visibility in any way. I don't know, a love offering, whatever it may be. Um, <laughs> don't forget your girl, you know, because I'm most certainly in the business of, of helping um, because that's how I've been able to be able to move forward is through the support and the help of others. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. Y'all, this has been an amazing show and Stephanie has been at the Church of Amazing as I'm sure you guys are over there with pen and, and pad writing, taking notes or open up your notes in your phone. If you got an iPhone, you're loyal. <laughs> you're taking notes in your phone. <laughs> And preparing yourselves as you go forward um, and reflecting on this throughout your week. I want to say again, thank you, Stephanie, so much. Thank you to Women at Work and thank you to her fiance, her team, uh, Zach Living Corporate, the whole nine. Just thank you guys so much for an awesome show today. And um, I want to say that's our show. So thank you guys for joining us on Living Corporate Podcast. Be sure to follow Stephanie. And Stephanie, how can our listeners connect with you? Oh, man. So I'm on all of your social media platforms, your Instagrams, Facebooks and Twitters. And that is at Women at Work with an E. Um, and so you can go to our website, womenatwork.com or at Women at Work on all of your other social media platforms. Absolutely. So make sure you follow Women at Work with an E. <laughs> and make sure you follow us on on Instagram at Living Corp, our Twitter page at Living Corp underscore pod. And subscribe to our newsletter through our www.livingcorporate.com. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer and read on the show, make sure you email us at Living Corporate Podcast at Gmail. And this has been Stephanie. And you've been, excuse me, this has been Shanisha. Lord have mercy. This has been Shanisha. And you white baby, okay? <laughs> And you have been listening to Stephanie Jones of Women at Work. So thank you guys so much. Peace. All right, y'all. Listen, you've been listening to Living Corporate. Hey, I'm really excited about the changes coming for Living Corporate in the next month or so. You need to make sure you're paying attention. It's coming down the pipeline. If you're not subscribed to Living Corporate, if you're not following us on social media, you need to click the links in the show notes and get familiar. You don't want to be on the outside looking in, catching up, right? You want to be proactive. You want to be prepared, okay? So make sure you do that. Make sure you're up to date. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you soon. Till then, this has been Zach. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.